I decided that I would focus on the taphonomy of Lucy, even though I have really not had the opportunity to study that skeleton in detail. I had a lot of opportunities to study 333, but because those bones and what I was doing with Bill Kimball and Elizabeth Harmon, we have not been able to publish for various reasons yet. Um, I'm going to go with the information that's available for Lucy, but also give you a taste of where 333 might contribute. So Lucy's discovery, as we've been hearing from many people, energized new questions, possibilities, in understanding our ancestors and bringing them back to life. Who were they? How were they related? What could they do? All the wonderful anatomical studies. Where did they live? Environments, habitats, faunas, and floras. And my niche in this uh, wonderful enterprise has been to think about how did they become fossils. And I'm really um, indebted to and standing on the shoulders of the the father of taphonomy who started work in South Africa on the cave deposits. Bob Brain uh, sadly uh, passed away last year after an amazingly long and productive and influential life. And I just wanted to show you this quote um, uh, that he put into his book. The, it's a detective story, but a rather odd one because the clues are bones. The aim is to establish causes of death but the evidence is ancient and there are no witnesses to relate their experiences. And also he said at that time, in that book in 1981, he found himself in an uncharted field where guidelines were few and ill-defined. So my uh, start in taphonomy uh, was in the early 70s and I got my PhD on that topic uh, and paleoecology in 1973. And it was from Bob Brain that I got some of my earliest inspiration. So taphonomy in here is a rather complicated uh, diagram, but taphonomy is complicated. Um, but if you follow from the biosphere to the lithosphere along these, these lines, you see that each one of the arrows has a filter and a little turbulence. And that is actually representing the fact that you're getting sampling and filtering of the information all the way through this process until you get the buried remains and the fossils. And then you actually still get filtering and human or modern scientists taking some parts of the body, able to recover them and all, before you get back to your reconstruction and of the biosphere, whatever you want to know. So e ecology is a lot of what we need to be aware of what's going on with the remains before they become buried. But geology is also a very important part of the, the whole uh, realm of transition of biosphere to lithosphere. So what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, chart a pathway that starts with the, what we know from the geology, the buried remains that were found actually on the surface, not in situ. And talk about what the evidence is there and then what the bones show us about the post-mortem history, which is organic remains on the land surface, and then say something about the many uh, ideas there have been about how Lucy actually died. And you know that in modern forensics, it can be very difficult to determine cause of deaths. So I don't want to raise expectations at this point about being uh, able to pronounce uncertainty. But I will give you this as an example of taphonomic thinking and uh, how the research design can lead you to new information. So we'll start right out with where and how are Lucy's remains buried. And the possibilities that have been proposed, uh, mudslides, these, many of these are published. Uh, rapid sedimentation of flood, slow buildup of sediment, trampling, and plant growth, which you may not know much about. I'm, I'm going to include those, though. And the evidence that we have is stratigraphy, sedimentology, association with other fossils, and reference to modern analogs. So, of course, the fossil site is in the Great Rift Valley. It's very different from the, the cave deposits that were, were where taphonomy in paleoanthropology got its beginnings. 
And uh, these are landscapes, and they're landscapes in, in a Rift Valley that's a very small part of the African continent, actually. And you can see the, the site, Lucy, it's a couple of kilometers away from AL333, and they're, they're pretty close in time as well. So I got to visit the site uh, when I was out there in the early 2000s, and you've seen this image before. Uh, what I'm going to point out here, though, is that there are various uh, topographic uh, differences. Um, the, you can see the sandstone layers. Uh, these are fluvial deposits, that is, they were deposited by rivers, sometimes uh, lakes and swamps. And from this kind of terrain, the geologists uh, uh, walk around and, and record uh, the details of uh, where the fossils were coming from. And from talking with people who were at the excavation, it's clear that the, the Lucy sand was a, a pretty distinct deposit um, and even though the fossils were not actually dug out of that sand. So there was a, a geologist, Tesfe Yamani, who worked in the, in the 90s uh, on this site and published, uh, well, his dissertation actually at the University of Iowa, has a wealth of, of detailed information that's relevant to saying where Lucy's remains were, were preserved. And Chris Camposano has since visited the site, he says it's, a, it's probably a crevasse splay deposit. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute. But what's also really important here is that the Lucy sand is immediately overlain by lake deposits uh, that had ostracods and other aquatic organisms, fish. And so by luck, this is another part of, the, of Lucy's luck, the, the fossils were preserved under uh, creating sediment that was uh, low energy. So that's the Lucy site is a reconstruction, and what you see there is kind of a, like a black snake going through. That's the river valley, and the crevasse splays are when a levee breaks, and you get a sudden uh, flux of sediment out onto the floodplain. And actually, on the, in the Awash River floodplain, walking around with Raymond Bonfi here, uh, we found a place where the levee had broken. You can see the sand had flooded through the, the terrain and covered up a lot of the vegetation as well as, as possibly bones that were there then. But also I wanted to show you this from the Lake Turkana and a crevasse splay from a channel. And this is very seasonal, of course. It's the flood time that, that the levee breaks and the new channels are created. And so this might have been something like the site where Lucy's remains were buried. And if you think of it then through the, the non-flood times, these could be places where there were trees growing fairly close to the lake or not, depending on how alkaline the lake is, and uh, swamps, uh, wetlands, and muddy flats. And that's the kind of place that I've studied in southern Kenya in Amboseli uh, Park where uh, it's very clear that the bones in these situations, even this is almost an entire skeleton of a buffalo, can form these cl clusters and be trampled on. And um, you can just imagine the plant growth and the trampling being very uh, important in well-populated areas of floodplains and lake margins in the past. So there's actually a lot of potential to, to do more study of this kind of taphonomy. Okay, so then what happened to Lucy's body between death and burial? Possibilities, scavenging, deflushed by intervertebrates, and uh, I've been learning about what safari ants can do to uh, freshly dead uh, chimpanzee uh, bodies um, in forest environments. It's pretty impressive. Uh, submerged in water, transported by water, maybe as a, as a whole carcass, as possibly the, the Turkana boy was before it ran aground and was, was finally buried. And again, trampling can be a, a major effect. So I'm just going to jump right to the evidence. I don't have time to go through all this, but what we see in Lucy's skeleton, uh, there definitely are a number of missing skeletal parts, more than half for sure. Uh, one or two tooth marks, which uh, I have not had an opportunity to examine myself. 
but the early people who looked at it, including Don, um, carefully looked for these kinds of features. And the bones are actually in really good condition, the parts that are there. Not much evidence of that. But uh, there are broken parts, there are fractures, there's crushing, cracking, some of that uh, likely from post-burial uh, long time in the rocks. But there is no evidence really of abrasion or of weathering, uh, what I would call pre-depositional weathering. Termite damage turns out to be really common uh, in Ambicelli and other places, and we're beginning to see, recognize it in fossils. And in places where there's a lot of woodland, you might expect a lot of termites. Then why they chew bones, um, you'd have to ask them. But um, they do it. They, they destroy a lot. Chewing by rodents, we don't see evidence of dissolution, such as would happen in acid water. We don't see either. Now, we're, uh, with Brianna Pobiner and with the sponsorship of the Leakey Foundation, I'm uh, hard at work establishing taphonomic reference collections so that there will be the opportunity for people in different museums to have known uh, documentation of different taphonomic features that could give clues about the, the uh, trace fossils, basically, that's what they are, that can tell you more about what happened to the skeletons uh, before they were finally buried. And this is just a, a quick look at a, at a bunch of them, including, you see, the crocodile tooth marks. But those are the kinds of things that, for the most part, we did not find uh, anywhere on the preserved Lucy skeleton. So uh, here's a graph uh, showing the body parts, the, skele the, the skeletal parts that are there versus those that are missing compared with a whole skeleton. The gray bars are the whole skeleton. So this is just the four major body parts. And you can see that. Uh, the appendicular bones, including a lot of the hand and foot bones, of course, are, are underrepresented, and the axial, in this case, somewhat overrepresented in this uh, skeleton. And I'm going to show you a few more graphs illustrating what comparative taphonomy can, can tell us based on this, which is, is good solid evidence from the parts that we have in the museum. So here's uh, a skeleton of a yellow baboon uh, from Amicelli that was a known study animal from Gene Altman's uh, group that uh, baboon studies there for many, many years. And we found the body uh, a year after uh, the animal was, went missing in a woodland environment. And uh, we carefully documented it. And uh, it was particularly interesting because it had uh, almost a complete vertebral column. Notice it was also partly buried in the litter uh, of that woodland soil. And parts of the skull, you can see the breakage of the cranium, which is maybe reminiscent of something we've been seeing uh, through other talks of Lucy. That would have been from trampling. There wasn't any evidence of, of chewing on the skull, but the jaws complete, the maxilla, um, and notice also the lack of the lower limb bones. Well, they get taken away by, by scavengers very easily. Uh, so again, appendicular bones underrepresented. So what caused Lucy's death? Possibilities that have been proposed. Flash flood or mudslide. Predator attack, mammal, mammalian carnivore or crocodile fall from a tree. Disease, other things that we can't really ever hope to test. This was an image uh, put together for, by National Geographic to, uh, to explain the 333 uh, assemblage of lots of hominids. It could also apply to, to Lucy, of course, but there's no geological evidence for that whatsoever in either site. And uh, of course, crocodiles uh, are a possibility, but they usually leave a, a more marks um, and do different kinds of deletion of skeletal parts. However, there were uh, three very large cats, saber tooths at that time. Uh, there were a couple of hyenas, um, and there were some smaller carnivores that are known. So the possibility of uh, 
ambush by a large field predator as a viable hypothesis. But on the other hand, there's evidence from modern felids, this is an experiment by Bob Brain, that uh, they are capable of chewing up the vertebral column very thoroughly and they leave the limbs. So that doesn't quite fit the pattern. Notice the difference between the, the ungulate where the vert vertebra column is, is much harder for a scavenger to take care of. So then what about the fall from a tree? Well, this was very elaborately published and talked about, and I haven't been party to this controversy at all. Uh, each one of the images on this uh, is a double of the bones of Lucy, showing the, in red the, the crushing marks. There is compressive fracturing, and it's, it's interesting. It's not something that people who've seen a lot of fossils are particularly surprised by because uh, there are lots of processes that can cause, can cause these post-burial and even by trampling. But I also just wanted to maybe reveal my, my feeling here about the, the idea that you would incur all those kinds of fractures and crushings from a fall from a tree, maybe if it were on concrete, but I don't think Lucy fell onto concrete. Um, most woodlands have a lot of bushes and shrubs and softer substrate under them and lots, lots of other ways to prevent that kind of fatal fall. So just a quickly a little bit now about 333. It's an amazing assemblage. We've heard quite a bit about it. We've seen images of these. And I was working with Bill and with Elizabeth uh, several years in the late 2000s to, and with the specimens to come up with the minimum numbers of, of individuals, which of course their expertise, expertise was crucial. And this is what we have, and it's not published yet, and that's why I don't want to talk very much more about 333. But it's a fascinating uh, continuing taphonomic puzzle that I hope to get, uh, get back to very soon. So this is what that skeletal part preservation looks like in the same kind of graph. Uh, and you notice that the axial elements are very underrepresented, which is a little bit like what Bob Brain found that cheetahs do to baboons. There may be other reasons why vertebrae are rare, but it's actually, and then when you line them up, it's quite strikingly different from uh, what we see with Lucy. And this one, taphonomic character that needs to be added to a lot of other evidence before we come up with final uh, conclusions. So just now summary, the, the burial, uh, I don't think, mudslide is out of the question, slow buildup of sediment would not have preserved the bones as well. Transport by water, the skeleton itself was not uh, sorted or transported. Um, and the flood or mudslide, cause of death. So I think you know, our process of thinking can, can eliminate some of these and then highlight some that are pretty uh, clearly possibilities and viable hypotheses. I think the fall from a tree, uh, there's more work that could be done to uh, possibly eliminate that as, as an option, but it's worth considering. It's worth part, being part of the debate and the mammalian carnivore, uh, if we do more work with modern analogs and the kinds of evidence that Lucy provides compared to what's out there and modern systems, we may be able to throw more weight onto that. And we'll never know about other possible causes of death. So the legacy for taphonomy and paleoecology, Lucy's um, helped to stimulate so much thinking about uh, how animals die. Our, our curiosity about how she died has extended much more broadly to see what we can do with this kind of evidence where there are no witnesses. And it also gives us some, some pause about uh, going too far in interpreting uh, some of these things that we'd like to know, but we really don't have the evidence for. And the comparative taphonomic research, I think, can now uh, be a new area to focus on and pinpointing the cause of death will remain elusive as, as it is for our own time. 
thank you so much um, for, ever, for being part of this, and especially to Don and Bill and Elizabeth and the Institute of Human Origins for everything they're doing, and also Lucy, as others have thanked, for helping to make my career, actually. <laughs>